my my aim will be probably to give you uh, hopefully better insight into the development in the region while focusing on Iran and Israel, but mainly mainly about Iran. Uh, so when you read newspapers, you'll understand better. I don't want to really to repeat the newspapers. I assume that you know what's going on and uh, more or less. Now, I, I would begin with uh, a, a general comment about Iran, that unlike what many people think, Iran is not a black or white. You know, you read Iranians, but speaking about themselves, they look, they sound as they are the, wonder, the most wonderful people, the most democratic, and everything is good. Just go and buy a ticket and visit Iran or stay in Iran. When you read other sources, you will find everything is ugly about Iran. Life is, not, is more complex than black and white. And uh, I think that Iran is, uh, is a civil society which is very active. There are better aspects of life in Iran. There, are, there is deep history of the Iranians uh, and culture that we often uh, don't uh, pay enough attention to. If I would say that, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how many people would be from here would be uh, aware that almost half of the Iranian people are people are not Persians. It shows another diversity. We have many Azerbaijanis, uh, Kurds, Turks, Arabs, uh, Baluch, uh, all over the country, mainly in the periphery of the country. So we should be more uh, careful when we speak about Iran not to uh, you know, stick to all kind of stigma that uh, we hear here and there. Now, Iran is basically, historically, is based on two major pillars in its history, its culture. And I think there is an ongoing struggle between two entities that form modern Iran as it is. It is a contest between, I would say, the heritage of Cyrus the Great, the king of Iran uh, 25 centuries ago, which is basically the history of monarchy, the culture, Persian culture, literature, poetry, Ferdowsi, Hafez, uh, the archaeology, the monarchy, and in recent uh, decades, closer relations with the United States, the national, nationalism, westernization, uh, and modernization. The other part of the Iranian entity an identity is the tradition of, I would say, Imam Hussein, Islam, Shiite Islam. As Imam Hussein is the most cherished, not the most, Imam Ali is higher, but the, the tradition of Imam Hussein, Imam Ali, the tradition of Shiite Islam. The Shah of Iran tried, he did as much as he could, to diminish the, the, the presence of Islam in public sphere, and basically base the country on new foundations of the same tradition of Cyrus the Great of the past, but with components of modern nation state that he wanted to basically present to the Iranian people as the model that they should adopt. He was not successful. Enough is to say that at the end of his role, his end came by the Islamic Revolution. Namely, that Islam still remained a very powerful element in Iranian society. I would say if you look at the last almost 40 years, 39 years of the Islamic Revolution, the Islamic Revolution wanted to do exactly the opposite, to eliminate the monarchy, the Persian pre-Islamic culture from the public sphere, from the identity of the Iranian people. And I would say that they also failed. And when they came to power, they wanted to send bulldozers that they destroyed the ruins of uh, Persepolis, the capital city of, of uh, Cyrus the Great. Luckily, they didn't do it, because later on today, they are also going back to use Koresh and the Iranian pre-Islamic history to strengthen their power. The, the grave of Cyrus the Great in Persepolis were visited by recent Iranian presidents. The poetry of Ferdowsi, the national poet of Iran, 
who, write, who wrote the Book of Kings that was forbidden in the early days of the revolution, uh, today is being taught in schools. Hafez, who writes so much about wine and women, and it's, it's also being taught in school because, and here is the situation in Iran. These two pillars are still very solid. You cannot take from the Iranian people their affiliation, identity, devotion to Islam, or in this case, Shiite Islam. At the end of the day, this is Islam, with all the differences between the two sects. But at the same time, you cannot take from them the new year, no rules. Even in Los Angeles, you celebrate no rules. And in Iran, they celebrate no rules, although no rules is not an Islamic uh, new year. So we see this dichotomy in Iranian uh, culture and history that in, is in competition. And I think that this Iranian ship of state is continuing to fluctuate between the two extremes in the last, since the late 19th, uh, 20th century, until they will come to some kind of uh, equilibrium between these two identities. And while there is a struggle between Islam and the West, and sorry, Islam and the monarchy, Islam and the Iranian culture, there is a third element infiltrated into the Iranian uh, his modern history, and it is the influence of Western culture. You know, many people say, well, is, is the West can go back to Iran? Iran, the West has never left Iran. Even at the peak of the Islamic Revolution, the culture of the West is being cherished and supported by many people in, in Iran. Islamic Revolution came to power, and they have to decide what foreign languages to teach. They teach English as a foreign language, to the point that they have to explain in, in the textbook why we need to teach without our anti death to America that we say, why we have to, 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 to teach English. Well, one is that we need, want to fight them, so we need their technology, and for this technology we, want, we need the language, or uh, uh, we want to export our revolution to influence them, so we need language, but at the end of the day, they, they, you cannot separate. You cannot, you cannot bring Western technology or modern technology, which is by and large Western, without bringing in some elements of culture. So, in fact, is, this Iranian psyche is being somehow influenced today by these triangular loyalties to Islam, to the Persian culture, and to Western uh, influence, Western civilization. And the struggle is, therefore, between these three elements. And this, there is also a struggle, a competition. It happens in any revolutionary uh, movement. Upon transition from opposition to power, now you have to implement your ideology. So there are, inter there are conflicts between the pure ideology, the professed ideology during the struggle, during the uh, revolutionary movement and the interest of, well, here's the, what interest of whom? Interest of the state, interest of the ruling elite, interest of Islam, but this is very easily being resolved in Iran because they say we are Islam. So they don't have this problem, what is the loyalty that you want to forge, because at the end of the day for them, Loyalty to Islam is loyalty to the Islamic revolutionary system, and it's, it is uh, equivalent, or, uh, and it's the same like supporting the current regime. But there is this conflict between the practical uh, interest of running a state. For example, when they came to power, Ayatollah Khomeini said that there is no difference between Muslims. All Muslims are brothers. There is no difference between Shiites, Sunnis, Baluch, Turk, and so on and so forth. The first decision in foreign policy of Iran was how you call this water between the Arabs and the Persians, which the Persian call the Persian Gulf, 
and the Arab call, the Arab Gulf, and basically there are two nations in the, in the world, I think, that they use the term Persian, Persian Gulf without any hesitation. It's Iran and Israel. And in many conferences that I have participated, there are Iranians, when I speak of Persian, Persian Gulf, the Arabs are angry, the Iranians are so happy, but, but it's, uh, you can see the last uh, statement of uh, uh, speech of your president, October 13th, it's not the last, he, he wanted to bring closer the Iranian people to him, so he's, but at the same time that he said we appreciate your culture, your history, and then he speaks about the Arab Gulf. But for God's sake, if you want to bring them closer, and they are all patriots, you know. And I saw this Iranian patriotism even here. It was two weeks ago in, uh, in an event organized by the Iran and American Jewish Federation. And they usually, the Iran and American uh, Jews, they have three anthems that they begin every ceremony. The one was the American one. And I realized that many of these people don't even know the words of it, which are not easy words. Then there was the Israeli one, and this, this was more, the atmosphere was more heated. And then, and this was the occasion was, on the 40th years, or almost 40 years, to the, to the execution of the leader of the Iranian Jewish community. And here is the Persian anthem, and you could see the crowd screaming and singing it. It's like, you know, you are in Tehran. So this, this question is patriotism. It's not only identity with this and that. Therefore, even on the issue of the nuclear weapon, you saw many, many people, even, even exiled Iranians who are not in line with the Islamic revolutionary system, they supported the nuclear uh, plan and the nuclear uh, deal that has been done. Now, when revolutions come to, come to power, usually faced with the harsh realities of life, they need to retreat often from the dogma for the sake of interest. And that's exactly what the Iranians are doing. Uh, there is no difference between Muslims. And then there is a, an article in the Iranian constitution that says that the president of Iran must be a Shiite of Iranian origin. If there is no difference, so why? The same, it's the constitution of 79. And in the first ele presidential elections in Iran, one of the leading candidates, his name was Jalal ad-Din Parsi, Jalal ad-Din the Persian. And then it was disclosed four days before the election that the father of Jalal ad-Din Parsi was Afghan, and Ayatollah Khomeini disqualified him. So uh, in many other issues, you could see this kind of retreat, and we don't have much time to go on it. But I, the point that I want to make here, that the revolutionary movements or any ideological or non-ideological ruler who comes to power, in fact, needs to recognize realities, which is OK. What they say in, in, in election campaign is not necessarily what they do in power. And I'm not speaking about any particular uh, government or administration. But they don't do it voluntarily. They, they retreat from dogma only when they are forced to do, when, only when there is no choice, when they, when they, only when they have to pay a heavy price. And for this you need leadership, and for this you need identification with the basic needs of your country. I'll give you one example. The most crucial decision made by the Islamic Revolution in its 39 years of power, in my view, was Ayatollah Khomeini's decision to end the war with Iraq. After eight years of the Iran-Iraq war, in 1988, he realized the price that the people are paying and the nation is, uh, is paying, and then he went to television, looked at the face of the people, let's say he looked at the, the people looked at him, and he said, my dear children, it would have been much sweeter for me to drink poison that signed an agreement with Saddam Hussein, but we don't have a choice. And I think that this, I say, to the credit of Ayatollah Khomeini, was being brave enough to realize, when he realized that its situation is bad, to make such a crucial decision after eight years in the slogan of Iran was, war, war until victory. I don't see in Iran today a president 
who will be facing his people and say, well, for 40 years we say, death to America, death to America, it's about time to change. And I think that that's the problem that Iran is facing today. They are captive in their slogans of the past and so far unwilling to change many of their tenets. Now, in the last few years, the Middle East has gone through significant changes. In many ways, the Middle East that we see today, and I know that many people call it the new Middle East. I don't know what's new. For me, new is better than the past. So it's, uh, it's not uh, really much better, but there, is a, there are new realities in the Middle East. And they all affect Iran. And, and by, by Iranian policy, they affect the region and beyond the region. First, the Middle East is an era of uh, crisis, deep crisis. The system of nation state that existed over the last 100 years is being threatened today. The loyalties are being changed from loyalties to the nation state to the loyalty to supranational philosophy of religion, or in many cases to sub-national uh, identities, the tribe, the clan, uh, the sect, Shiite, Sunnis, uh, and you see today the wars in the Middle East are in line, and, and I don't want to predict here that it's the end of the nation state. I don't think it is. But what we have is a failing states, malfunctioning states, who cannot, he cannot create stability and resolve the problems of the region, of, the, of their countries. Look at Libya, Syria, Yemen, you name the others. Now, with this situation of the nation states not functioning, basically they are not capable of providing the people with their basic needs. And let me remind you, what are the basic needs? Many people speak about the Islamic revolution, and it was Islamic religious revolution. It was. It, by name, it's Islamic revolution. By its roots, I don't think it's Islamic revolution. I lived in Iran the last two years, with Shah's rule. I was doing study at Tehran University. And there are people here that have been at that time in Iran. The young people of Iran who went to the streets, their goal was not to establish Islamic Republic of Iran. Their goal were two or three. One, social justice. One, political justice. And dignity of the Iranian people. Even shorter, I can say, there was, the struggle was about liberty and bread, freedom and welfare, and dignity. Look at Iran today. There is no greater freedom today in Iran that used to be under the Shah. The Shah was not, was not a democrat. Okay? I learned to appreciate democracy when I lived in Iran, because this was the first time I've been in a non-democratic state. And only when you live in a non-democratic state, you learn to appreciate what is democracy. So I don't say that the Shah was a democrat, but under the Shah to speak and act against him, against him was a crime. Today, to act against the Islamic regime is a sin. And I will leave to you to decide which of them is better. The rich, they may have changed. Some of them left. The other emerged. The rich are having wonderful life. But this revolution was were under, under privileged elements of the Iranian society. And I don't think they have, their, their goals have been materialized. Look at the Arab Spring. It is another change in the in the Middle East. This wonderful movement that emerged in early 2011, from beginning from Tunisia, moving to Egypt, moving to uh, Libya, Bahrain, uh, Syria, all over. Their aim was again freedom. Their aim was again jobs, welfare, Better life for the children, for themselves, for their children. 
And these lovely movement was actually turned to be a disappointment. Because if you look at Egypt, after Mubarak uh, came uh, Mursi, Islamic brothers, and it was, they forced, someone forced a change in the government, and democracy it did not bring. But even worse, in a country like, like Syria, it's heartbreaking to think how many people have been killed and how people, how many millions have been refugees in their country and out of their country. I think that they said that 600,000 Syrians have been killed or 600,000 people have been killed in the last six years in Syria. It's a huge number. Each of them is a family, if their children, old people, young people. And this is all in names of factions, tribes in Syria, in Yemen, the most devastating situation of all the countries, the weakest economically of all the Arab countries probably. So there is the Arab, the Arab Spring also brought big change that it was in line with the ideals of the people who started, but when the system collapsed, uh, and uh, struggles continue, and it is benefiting the Iranians. Because out of all the countries, Iran is the best in, when we say in Hebrew that they are fishing in a muddy water, they, they know how to do it. And so what, what, what makes them so powerful is not that much because Iran is so strong and powerful, because their enemies are weak. But still, relatively, they become more powerful, and I come back to it a, a bit later. I can say here that the number of Muslims killed by the Iranians since the Islamic Revolution is dozens of times more than all the Jews and Arabs killed in the Arab-Israeli conflict over the last of the Zionist Arab conflict in the last 120 years. Not that we don't have a problem with the Palestinians, with the Arabs, with the Israeli Arabs, but I just to put it in proportions, when you have maybe 800,000 people killed in eight years of war, or 700,000, it doesn't really make much difference. If it's, well, it does make for each individual, but the numbers are huge. And uh, so the Arab Spring also contributed to uh, the conflict between Sunni and Shiites, between different tribes, the emergence of more extremist elements like uh, ISIS, Daesh, I don't know how you call them. They usually have been in the first, there was ISIS. And uh, like many of my friends who are members of ISIS, and not this one, uh, in International Society of Iranian Studies. We were so angry about this ISIS. We are glad that they call it now ISIL or whatever. But it's, this, this, is, this is the result of the break of the central authority. And not that Saddam Hussein was a Democrat, but look what happens when he moves, uh, when others come in. And the Arab, the, the Arab Spring is, in a way, a, is a sign of the collapse of Arab nationalism that started earlier on, but reached its peak in, uh, during the Arab Spring. And uh, it uh, paves the way to greater extremism. There is also change in the alignments in the Middle East. Uh, first, we see the weakness of the Arabs vis-a-vis -vis the non-Arabs in the Middle East. We used to call the Middle East the Arab Middle East. Well, if you look at the big powers in the Middle East, none of them is Arab. 
What are the powers, in my view, in the Middle East? Turkey, Egypt. No, I don't even include Egypt. Give me what? Turkey, Iran, and Israel. None of them is Arab. Now there are two emerging Arab countries, like like Egypt and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia today. But still, they are not in any way close to the power of Turkey, Iran, and Israel. And alliances ch keep changing. The only alliance that was really s remains solid is the Syrian-Iranian relations. They started in the early days of the revolution and they continue so far. All of a sudden, you know what? Uh, I don't know if I should be happy about it or not. Last year I was in the Wilson Center in Washington to give a talk and all the talks were about, about other parts of the Middle East and the name of Israel was not mentioned, uh, not in my lecture and the other like, two lectures in the same panel. And then I said, you know, for years we Israelis try to convince the world that Israeli-Arab issue is not the only problem of the Middle East. There are other problems in the Middle East. Now I am here to beg you to realize that there is also Arab-Israeli conflict. Let's not forget it. We don't mean it doesn't exist. I'm not happy that people don't speak about it. We have been with Maura in the lecture this afternoon and still tell me, no, Israel was not mentioned. Well, I don't know if it's good or bad that it's not mentioned. I don't like them to mention all the time Israel. Everything that Israel does is not good. I was reading in a study about the Israeli army in terms of moral, was one of the first best in treating women in occupied territories. The number of rapes in under occupation in the world, the lowest number is by the Israelis. And I thought, well, it's a fit, something is written about you know the moral of uh, uh, the morality of this. And then I was go a few uh, sentences later. I see an Arab comment on it. And this is, you know why the Israeli soldiers don't rape the Palestinians? Because our racism, and it's not in their, uh, you know, it doesn't give them this, even the appetite to rape a woman who is Palestinian. So no matter, damn it if you do or damn it if you don't do, you have still a problem. But I think the Arab Israelis, I want to say that it's still, it's still a problem. Now, we Israel was in dilemma in the last few years. Which side to take in Syria? And the conventional wisdom was that the evil that you know is better than the evil that you don't know. Namely, you know Hafez al-Assad. We know how to deal with him. But we don't know what is ISIS and what is all these radicals, the non-state entities. So basically, the policy of Israel was in, in a way not to encourage the collapse of the Syrian government. My point is that we think that there is an evil that we know. We don't recognize that the situation is changed. And we do not necessarily know what we think we know. Because things have changed. Uh, but we are stuck in our concept of what is Hafez al-Assad and what is B, C, and D. And I think one of the things that Israel did not do good in the last few years is not to adjust its policy to the changing realities of the Middle East. But the Iranians are very good in it. When Iranians realized that they, they are going to lose the war in Syria two years ago, they initiated contacting Putin and convince him to send this through. You didn't have to work hard to convince uh, Putin to send his air force in this region. But I think that in a way, there was a, a recognition of Iran of their weakness, not because of their strength. They didn't bring uh, Russia because they were strong. They brought Russia because they were weak. But see what happened also in the international scene. America is signaling that they want to go out, not from now. It started maybe even before Obama, but certainly under Obama. 
And what you do after years of intervention and policy in the Middle East, when you have allies in the Middle East, one of them is Saudi Arabia, one of them is Israel, one of them is Egypt, all of a sudden you signal that you want to go out, of course someone else will come in. Vacuum doesn't remain as a vacuum. And what we see today is a kind of change of guards. And I'm sorry that I don't have much to tell you about the current administration because I don't really understand what is this current administration doing. But at least under, under Obama, this was the situation. So that that is, is the United States is out. And if I may say something good about the current administration, the, the one good thing that I can see is they frightened Iran to death. Don't, don't pay attention to what they say. They are, they, well, they, they are, they are, they are afraid because first, they don't, know, they don't know what to expect, as though you know what to expect, but they don't know what to expect. And they had a wonderful deal in hand, and it's another element of the changing Middle East and the rising power of Iran. They made a, a, a nuclear deal, which was the best gift given by uh, someone to Iranians for many, many years. Now, if Iranians are uh, fair with themselves, and they ask the question, which is the country that helped Iranian national security more than any other country in the world, there is only one answer, the United States of America. The United States which led a coalition to destroy the military power of uh, Iraq in 1991, the enemy number one with which Iran was in war for eight years. Then they moved to 2002 to remove the enemy number two of Iran, the Taliban in Afghanistan. When you remove from the neighborhood, from the east border and west border, the two major enemies, of course it is wonderful for Iran. And in 2003, they moved on and removed Saddam Hussein altogether. In 2009, when the young Iranian people were in the streets, for 10 days, the President of the United States did not say a word. I, do, I don't suggest that you should have hugged and praised this movement. It may be a kiss of death to them. But for 10 days, not to say a word about these younger millions of people going to the streets and demonstrating. You, you know, Obama has a meaning in Persian. If you read the word a bit differently, you call Obama, it means he is with us. And then later during the demonstration, they started saying, Obama is, he is not with us. But you know, there's something that you may not recognize. When any nation goes and have the elections at home, they decide the destiny of their people. When the Americans go to vote, they, they influence the history and the life of people in many other countries. It so happens in Iran, and without taking any side in your political uh, argument, uh, uh, debates, whenever there is a Democrat president in the United States, you can expect young Iranians going to demonstrations. It was under Mossadegh when Truman was president. It was in, under Kennedy in 63. Uh, it was Carter, the Islamic Revolution, Clinton 2009, and, two, uh, and uh, Clinton 1999, and Obama 2009. Why? Because they look they know that there is someone who is sensitive to human rights and political rights, and they believe that we now go to the streets. At least this greatest superpower will be with us. So, therefore, one of the slogans of this movement was in 2009, Obama, 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 Anha. are you with us or with them? And the answer was, Obama, Nist, he's Nist, Nist with us, he's not with us. Iran in 2013 was in a devastating situation. It was on its knees. It has uh, suffered in its, its proxies in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Lebanon. They were all in a devastating situation. 
to the point that Hafez al-Assad used chemical weapon against his own people, which happened to be a red line that drawn by President Obama. So what happened? Nothing. And I think this is the beginning of emergence of Iran. When you sit in Tehran and you say that, you see that they cross this kind of red line by the American president and there is no punishment. If they don't punish Syria, would they punish us with our nuclear problem? Forget about it. And I think it was a fair conclusion. And Iran became uh, more willing also to speak with the Americans. And I must admit that I was very supportive of the nuclear uh, deal. I always think that it's better to speak with your enemy rather than fight with your enemy. Uh, at the day he was elected, I think it was today, it was today or yesterday, 2008, True, it was eight. I think November eight. He was the elections, and I was. Uh, I had a flight. I was in Washington. I had a flight to Montreal. I was uh, to come to a lecture. I gave a lecture, and I say that uh, uh, it is a happy day for me to see the results of the elections. Not only because of uh, the dialogue, but because of other things that you can imagine. Why it's good for America to have. <laughs> President like Obama. That's what I thought at that time. I was googling something a few days later, in the, and I saw that uh, quote from my talk in Montreal, which says that Professor Nashri opened his remark by saying that the election of Obama was the happiest day of his life. <laughs> my wife is sitting here, so I already apologized to her. I would not have dared to say that this is the happiest day of my life, but I was happy with the dialogue. And, but I didn't think that the dialogue can lead to wholesale the way it was. And when we knew that there is kind of uh, a deal, and I'm not sure we know all the details of the deal even now, it was a bit too late. Because what was the asset that Iran, America had, the West had? That there was a transatlantic alliance. Even Russia and China were partners to the sanctions. Iran was weak. You had a unified uh, front. Sanctions were giving hell to the Iranian government, not only to the people. And that's why they brought them to negotiation table. Uh, and they used this low position that they had to do a deal that is as I said, the most important gift that they gave. It was so good, you know, how I understood finally it was so good. When I saw the Iranian asking their people not to celebrate the day the deal was announced, not to make them believe that, well, we are happy we got a good deal because we continue and say it's a bad deal. When, when President uh, uh, Trump spoke about uh, putting an end to this deal, uh, we saw how, how scared they have been. And they continue and they, uh, they demand sticking to the, to the deal. Now, uh, what does this bring us? This brings us to a situation that Iran today feels strong. And the Iran that feels strong, it goes back to its initial ideological dogmatic principles of 1979. Export the revolution, take leadership of the Muslim world. We are the world, not only we are Islam. And since then we see them uh, celebrating. Can you show this uh, the Iron Fist one? This, the, the next slide here. Well, this is the, what, what appeared on the website of Ayatollah Khomeini one week after this uh, new nuclear deal. Iron fist, that's how we broken, how I go with this? The, the how we broken the, other one. Yeah. broken the power of Iraq, America. And this is the Supreme Leader Khamenei. Those who have leveled sanctions against us yesterday are dying today because Iran has become the regional foremost military. 
and the defense minister, you can read, despite their great pride, the regime of the arrogant United States sat humbly behind the negotiating table and obeyed the right of the Iranian people. And Khamenei made it public. We are not going to retreat from the goal, death to America, because this is part of the DNA of the Islamic Revolution. Now Iran pretends to be an empire. Iran was an empire. And that's one of the power of Iran, their, their depth of history. That's like Yunusi, former intelligence minister. Iran was born an empire. It is once again empire with its capital, Iraq, the center of Iranian heritage, culture, and identity. Iraq has turned to be the capital city of Iran, of Iranian empire. Or if you look at uh, Rahim Safavi, former commander of the Revolutionary Guard, Iran's lines of defense against Israel stretches to South Lebanon, and our strategic defensive depth reaches to the Mediterranean and above Israel's head. This is the power of the Iranian arrogance. And then, a week before the implementation day, a, day before, a week before implementation day, they capture American sailors in the, in the Gulf. And see, this is the first picture is the American soldiers, and they showed it to American television. They showed the picture of these young men crying, and I felt so bad when I see this. I felt bad because of you Americans that I like so much. That, that's the way they presented American soldiers crying. Uh, and that's this parade in the street, uh, some kind of uh, customs of the uh, of the of the sailors and what they did to them in, in the streets of the now they they view themselves as the leading force in the Muslim world. Uh, the authority of the leader of Umel Qura. I don't want to go with you to the question of Umel Qura. Umel Qura, those who know Hebrews, Em Hakrayot, the mother of all tongues. Umel Qura in Arab literature and philosophy is Mecca, is the holiest place for the Muslims. And they claim that we are today Umel Qura. We are the citadel of Islam. And when in the citadel of Islam there is a ruler who is cleric, his authority should be respected by all Muslims, those in Egypt, in Lebanon, or wherever. And you can hear it for yourself. And Muhammad Mezbah Yasdi, one of the, the grand ayatollahs, if a certain Islamic state is, ruled, is, is, is run by the rule of the jurisprudence, which is the case in Iran, his, orders is by, his order is binding for everyone, every Muslim, even Muslims in non-Islamic countries. Uh, this is something else, but I'll just tell you. The first chancellor of Tehran University, Ander Khomeini, says basically, in reality, I think the two lines, what is the difference between Islamic State and the Islamic Republic? When that I there is a Shiite ISIS, and there is a Sunni ISIS. Our government, his government, that Khomeini appointed him to be the chancellor of Tehran University, is not much different than ISIS. Now, I want to show this one minute uh, clip of, uh, not all of them are like this. Not all the Iranians hate America. God forbid, they, they, the Iranian people love America more than any nations or any other nation in the Middle East, with maybe with the exception of Israel. It's a, a friend of mine who was one of the American hostages in Iran told me that uh, in the, de the first days of the Islamic Revolution, there were graffiti on the walls of the, of the American embassy. And one of them said, Yankees go home. And someone added under it, and take me with you. <laughs> so that's, that's how much they hate America. Another friend, also happened to be one of the hostages, John Limber, he told me that there was a caricature 
that uh, suggesting to change the slogan death to America with life imprisonment to America. <laughs> so I didn't find the caricature, but what I found is flu to America <laughs> or, or uh, fever to the American. It, it, but they stick to this. Uh, now, but there are people, it is, it's okay? Yes. yes. I can pass my Yes. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> this is an Iranian professor, a wonderful man, who tried not to step on the flag of Israel of the United States. And watch him now going to the flag of the United States. <laughs> no, that's really, this man is, should be, his courage should be recognized. He was put on trial two weeks ago. Not because of this, because many other things that they are See, it's pressuring, pushing people. So that's, uh, that's another time. So you have, you have different, as I said, there are different phases. The problem is that power is in the hands of the more radical extremists and others. So about Israel, I think that the situation is clear. Israel is now surrounded by Iran. Israel, Iran is in the Golan Heights. Iran is in Lebanon, Iran is in Gaza. You don't have to believe me. Go and see what the Iranians themselves say. They say that they fought the wars in Lebanon. They supplied them the missiles. And not, again, not all Iranians like it. The money that Iran has put in the last two years in adventures beyond the borders, if they will continue it for 10 years of the nuclear deal, it will be more than all the san sanctioned money unfreezed. Okay, it's billions of dollars a day, a year, when Iranian people are starving and having difficulties. I don't know, not all of them are starving, but uh, having difficulty. And then we have, for example, in Iran, people with this apocalyptic uh, vision that God has uh, sent them to save the nation, and they are paving the day, the way to the return of. The, the Imam that the Shiites are expecting, the Mahdi, the Shia, the Messiah. He was in the UN, he gave a speech, and this he, he called, uh, he prayed to hasten the return of the Imam, which is still okay. When he went back, went back he was telling the Ayatollahs about, about his experience in Iran, in, in the UN. He said, during the 27 minutes that I spoke, people told me, he says, and I realized myself, there was a hail of light above my head with God protection. <laughs> no, go, go and, go and uh, Google it. Now, there is also a light here, but it, <laughs> my, mine is different. Now, i tell you my, my conclusion of it. People who speak like this should not get close to nuclear weapons. They should not get close to push the bottom. And this man was eight years president, and he was again willing to be president in 2017. Very briefly, I would say about, about some general things, that are just as food of thought. There is a lack of understanding of the cultures of each other. They say something, you interpret it by your own culture and get different conclusions. One example. Khamenei say that he suggests to have uh, which is softness towards the enemies, softness of the champions. It was translated into English as heroic flexibility. And everyone spoke about the flexibility of the Iranians. For God's sake, he said what he said. He said it's like the champion, like someone in the stage, a boxer, boxing with each other. When he sees that he's in disadvantage, he should show flexibility, go one step back, and then come and punch in the face. <laughs> and this is not moderation. What, what happened, therefore, that you make strategic change in your policy, like America did with the nuclear weapon, the Americans doing a tactical change. Uh, I doubt that Shiites can, can rule over a nation. Shiism is a religion of struggle, of opposition. 
They, the moment, and I, I can, can read to you from Professor Dabashi that I don't like Dabashi from Colombia on his views about Israel, but about Iran I can identify what he says. Shism is a religion of protest. It can never be in power. As soon as it is in power, it contradicts itself. It can never politically succeed because its political success is its moral failure. And he goes on to explain why Shiites cannot, uh, cannot really succeed in power. And I think this is another, I put it in a simpler way, I say, the emerging of their power gave them this kind of chutzpah to believe that they can tell the world how to behave and do everything. And for a religion that has been always, it, it is a failed religion. If you take Shiite, Shiite were 15% of, uh, of Muslims, so this is not the majority, this is not the main uh, uh, line of Islam. There are 85% who are Sunnis. And you want to control them, you want them to obey your leader. So I don't think it's possible, but at Iran, Shiism is a sad religion. They don't have happy holidays. What well, people say, the New Year. The New Year is not, is not Muslim. The birthday of the, of the Prophet, the birthday of Ali, that's right. But their main uh, celebration, uh, holidays are the massacre of their Imams. There have been 12 Imams in Shiite, Iranian Shiite Islam. 11 of them were killed young. The 12th the 12 disappeared to return in the 19th, 9th century to return one day. So if you look at the face of the Iranians, you don't see smile. Unless recently, you see, Zarif is full of smile. Uh, I saw there is only one picture of Khomeini smiling until uh, in my class here, you know, we, we learn from our students. So one of the students showed me another picture of him smiling. But there are, there is a handful of pictures of him smiling. He is usually very, very, very uh, angry. Uh, now, uh, to conclude, uh, Iran today celebrates his power. They look around themselves and they sp see themselves in control of four Arab capitals. I didn't read to you Mehdi Taeb, one of these uh, other heroes today. Syria is the 35th district of Iran and the strategic this, this district is a strategic district for it. Losing it would lead to the loss of Tehran. It is more important than Khuzestan, a province populated mostly by Arab who was on the Persian Gulf and suffered during the Iran-Iraq war. And he says, in, someone else in the, the different case, if Egypt will fall and be destroyed, nothing will happen to Islam. But if Tehran will fall, it will be the end of Islam. So that's the feeling that they have today. And a final word about Israel. I said before, we did not really recognize the opportunities that have been in the Islamic revolution, the Iran-Iraq war. And we stick to our old dogma, the Arabs are enemies. Well, the Arabs have been enemies. Many of them are still enemies. They are not lovers of Zion. But as Prime Minister uh, Rabin said, you don't make peace with, uh, with your friends, you make peace with enemies. But today, while in the 50s, Ben Gurion, the first Prime Minister, came with this doctrine of we, don't, we cannot have relations with our neighbors, let's develop relations with the neighbors of the neighbors. He didn't want to say the enemies of the enemies. So who are the neighbors of the neighbor? Iran, Turkey, Ethiopia. I think that today we have to change our attitude and try and speak with the immediate neighbors. Now, it's not going to be easy. It's, it, this is a conflict between two stubborn peoples. Uh, no one is willing to compromise. But I want to show you the last. Uh, I received it from a friend of mine in Tehran. There are people who read Persian here. It says, I'll read it in English. Ships in the, in the ocean, in the sea, 
If they are not in motion, their destiny is decided by the waves. If you don't have a policy, if you don't move, ultimately the waves will carry you here and there. And I think that very briefly my suggestion to my government and the Arab governments, when to recognize that we are in the middle of storm and we cannot stand still, we need to come with new initiatives. And I hope that President Trump will help us because he's made it one of his uh, goals to try and move this ship of peace to bring us closer to the Arab countries. Thank you.